Hi everybody. So we are now on Act 1, Scene 2 of A Raisin in the Sun. So I'm just going to go ahead and move forward. The first slide here is a summary of this scene. So it's the next morning, Saturday. The scene begins when the check is about to arrive. And we see the women cleaning the apartment. It's a normal Saturday chore for the family. Um, Walter is out. Ruth is out for the moment, but we know that both of them return when um, the scene continues. Roaches infest the apartment. They seem to have a little bit of fun cleaning together. And pretty soon, um, a phone call interrupts, and the phone call is from Asagai, who is the other suitor of Benita. He comes to visit. He brings beneath a presence and converses with her family. He converses with Mama because the other two are not there at the moment. And the youngers do receive the check in the mail. Travis comes in. Mama asks Travis to count the zeros on the check for her to make sure it's $10,000. Mama's very wistful about the check. She understands that that check is the result of her husband's death and all of the hard work that forced him to die early. We also find out where we, Ruth went earlier that morning. Ruth went to an abortion doctor. We saw at the end of scene one that she was faint and mama sort of figures out and suspects that she's been to see someone who's not the regular doctor. She doesn't believe that they can afford to keep the baby nor are she and Walter in a decent emotional place to do so. And so she's already put a $5 down payment on the abortion doctor. Everyone fights over the money and the check, even though the check has come. And um, we know Walter wants it for the liquor store. The scene ends with all of them, Ruth, Walter, and Mama, arguing over the money, life, freedom, the baby, and Walter's dreams. So let's move to the next slide now. Um, here we're talking about Walter and I've divided this slide and I'm this slideshow, I'm sorry, and I may do so for the rest of the slides into characters because as we know in reading plays, the dialogue and sometimes monologues of characters as well as characterization is the main way that we understand the themes and um, motifs of a particular play. So I'll start with Walter, even though he comes in later, he is um, the central figure in not necessarily this scene, but from the introduction, we understand that being the main um, male figure of the play in that time and that place, he's cemented to become the new patriarch of the family in the place of his father. And so here he comes in, presumably he's been speaking with Willie and Bobo about the liquor store. And some of the characteristics of Walter have shown up even in the introduction, which was the last scene. We're now in the rising action of the play because they finally have the check. Um, Walter's selfish, egotistical, hard-headed, and stubborn characteristics are all coming out. But at the same time, we look at him as very idealistic because he does want this money for his family. On page 812, I know some of you don't have the book yet, and we are trying to rectify that. Um, and those of you who need to purchase the book um, or rent it, there are lots of different places that you can do so. But here on page 812, Walter screams in the middle of the page, will somebody please listen to me today? He believes that no one is listening to his dreams and ideas. And he asks his mom, oh, so don't you aim to speak on that again? So you have decided. Mama said she is not going to invest in a liquor store. And Walter starts to leave. 
Ruth says that's what he always does. He just shuts down and leaves. And they start having a fight. Ruth says on page 813, he makes me sick to my stomach. And Walter says, that was my greatest mistake. So he's saying some things that are very heartful, harm, harmful and hurtful. And we'll see some of those later in the, in the um, play. Mama says to him, seems like you getting to a place where you always tied up in some kind of knot about something. But if anybody asks you about it, you just yell at them and bust out the house and go out and drink somewhere. And on page 814, Walter says, in trying and attempting to explain himself, sometimes it's like I can see the future stretched out in front of me, just plain as day. The future, Mama, hanging over there at the edge of my days, just waiting for me, a big looming blank space full of nothing. So he believes that without the money that that check brings, and he wants all the money for himself. We know that each of them need $30,000 down payment for the liquor store, or they, each of them need 10,000, he, Willie, and Bobo, for a $30,000 total. So he wants all of the money as the down payment. Mama says, how come you talk so much about money? And Walter says, because it is life, Mama. And Mama says, oh, so now it's life. Money is life. Once upon a time, freedom used to be life. Now it's money. I guess the world really do change. And so Walter replies back, it's always been about money. And Mama argues that freedom for her generation was most important. It wasn't about making money. It was about being free. So, okay, let's move on to the next slide. Ruth and Mama. Ruth and Mama sort of fit together in this. They're both more realistic than Walter and Benita, for that matter. They are unhappy in the apartment with its roaches and its sides. The family is the center of their existence. We found out in the last section that they both desire the house. That's a dream of theirs so that they can um, have a great place with a yard and safety for Travis to grow up. And both Mama and Ruth wonder about Walter's priorities. As I mentioned in the last slide, he just slams out the door and leaves. Are his priorities his family? Are his priorities instead himself and getting ahead and pride? And the idea of pride um, is quite important in this play. Mama is a very proud woman, and she's raised very proud children, too. But Walter's pride often gets the best of him. Um, a couple of quotes about Ruth and Mama, where Ruth is very excited on page 11 to actually see the check. And Mama says, well, I don't know what we all so excited about around here. We known it was coming for months. And Ruth said, that's a whole lot different from having it come and being able to hold it in your hands, a piece of paper worth $10,000. Now, in 1959 or thereabouts when the play is taking place, remember the setting is Chicago, the time is sometime between the end of the war and the present day, which for Lorraine Hansberry was 1959. The check would be worth in today's dollars about $300,000. So that is definitely life-changing money. And Ruth and Mama um, have these very similar ideas. They're grounded. They're much more grounded than the children. But the children in some ways represent the progressive future and what's to come for the African-American um, race. Whereas Ruth and Mama represent sort of the present, as well as the centeredness of family. Okay, so let's move on to the final slide is about Benitha and Asagai. So Asagai comes for a visit bearing gifts for Benitha. He is a Nigerian who 
also presumably goes to college with Benifa. Benifa met her on the college campus and he'd been away for a while studying in Canada, but now he's back to Chicago. He brings the Nigerian robes and records for Benifa. We find out the nature of their relationship. He has feelings for her. She wants to wait and see how she feels. At the bottom of page 808, Asagai says, um, we have a great deal to talk about. I mean, about identity and time. And Asagai says, yes, about how much time one needs to know what one feels. He says, between a man and a woman, there need be only one kind of feeling. I have that for you, now even, right this moment. And Benita says, I know, and by itself, it won't do. I can find that anywhere. Asagai says, for a woman, it should be enough. And Benita says, I know, because that's what it says in all the novels that men write, but it isn't, go ahead and laugh. But I'm not interested in being someone's little episode in America or one of them. So we understand that Benitha, with George and with Asagai, wants someone who she can identify with. She wants someone who will understand her and converse with her rather than just want her for being a woman, for having sex and being able to marry and have babies. Um, we do find out also, and this is the last thing I'll talk about from this segment, is uh, what Asagai calls her. He calls her Alayo, and it's a nickname for her that um, she doesn't even know what it means. And at the bottom of 809, he says, well, let me see. I do not know how just to explain it. The sense of a thing can be so different when it changes languages. And he says, finally, it means one for whom food is not enough. And I like that. That name becomes symbolic then for Benitha. Food, which is sustenance, which is the barest necessity that we need for life, is not enough. Bread or food is not enough. What she needs is more. She needs more to find herself, to express herself, to find her identity, and to be a strong woman who wants to become a doctor. So thinking of her as a lio is a very interesting way to understand who Benita is. So that we're sort we're at the end of Act One, Scene Two, where um, uh, Walter finds out that his wife is pregnant and he just leaves. Mama calls him a disgrace to your father's memory. So that's all for right now on this particular act and scene.